Welcome to Out of the Box Radio with me, your host, Christine Blasdale. Out of the Box Radio is a weekly podcast of audible ear candy dedicated to bringing a fresh perspective on this thing that we call life. And each and every week, we're going to be diving into the topics that matter most with lively conversations on issues such as health, wellness, and transformational healing, all with the goal of creating a better world and becoming a happier human being. I will be your tour guide for this epic adventure, and each and every week we're going to be embarking on a journey with the ultimate goal being transformation to our highest potential. And now, let's get out of the box. Hello everyone and welcome back to Out of the Box Radio. I am your host, Christine Blasdale, and I am so very happy that you tuned in today because I have a very special program for you. We have a very special program for you. My guest today is Scott Russell Hill, Australia's acclaimed authority on paranormal and spiritual phenomenon. He's known as the world's most accurate psychic, and he starred in the Australian and New Zealand versions of the most popular uh, psychic detective show called Sensing Murder, and is the author of several books on his journey and as a psychic. And in them, uh, teaches you how to tap into your very own intuitive psychic nature. And he's here with us all the way from Australia. I want to welcome you, Scott, to the program, to Out of the Box Radio. Thank you so much for joining us today. Christine, what a lovely introduction. Thank you. Now, I wanted to, I always, always love with the guests that we have on the program to talk about how they began their journey. I think it's important for listeners to know that we have so much in common with one another, but in particular with your gifts, the talents that you have truly developed and uh, honed in on over the years. Obviously, as a child, those were present, maybe not to the extent they are now, but can you talk about that journey, about growing up as someone with a very deep connection with your psychic abilities and what it was like? Well, absolutely, yes. For me, <clears throat> when I was seven years old, I went with my dad fishing one Saturday afternoon and um, I we were, he, he went off to, we were in a sort of a tranquil location, not a lot of people around, uh, and I walked along a marina uh, very separate to where my dad was. He was on the other side and uh, I sat down on the marina and there was nothing to sit on. I don't know where... Christine, my head was at the time, but I was just looking at all the pretty boats and looking at the water and the the, the, the the beautiful blue sky. And I went to sit on this marina and because I was sitting on the very edge of it as a seven-year-old, I fell backwards, hit my head on the bow of a boat, was knocked unconscious and fell into the water and basically began to drown. Um, my dad, who I found out in later years was also um, extremely interested in, in ghosts and spooky things. Um, but I didn't know that as a young fellow, but I I did find that out later. Um, he had an intuitive flash over the other side where he was fishing. That was something was wrong. Couldn't see me, ran around, ended up jumping in the water, fully clothed and pulled me out of the water. Um, and that Christine is how it all began for me. That, that experience under the water, which I, I write about in, uh, my my first book, Caught Between Two Worlds, that the book actually opens on I was seven years old when I fell off a, a pier and, and hit my head on the bow of a boat. And and under the water, Christine, there was uh, a, a swirling white light that came towards me and an incredible peace. Um, it was never a fright, frightening experience. I can still, even as I talk to you now, see the whole thing as it's playing out. A little fish swam past and there's little bits of um, seaweed or fern in the water and I... It's sort of a murky, grey, brown coloured water and I'm looking up towards the surface even as, as I talk to you, I can still see it and see the spa, uh, the sunlight sparkling through the top of the water. But within the water was a, a, a brilliant, bright light that, that channeled its way towards me. And um, a lady appeared to me in the light and I always called her an angel. But she was, to me, she was like a classic movie star from the 50s. She had that gorgeous that gorgeous 50s movie star look about her, but she was all white and she glimmered in white. And she she said to me that it wasn't my time yet that I had to go back, but I was quite drawn to the light. And I said, I don't really want to go back. I'd rather go towards the light. But she (laughs) said, no, your mum and dad need you and you've got other things to do. And with that, she disappeared. And that was when my dad yanked me by the, the shirt collar and 
pulled me out of the water. Um, and that's when the pain and the physical pain actually began. That's when I couldn't breathe. Um, I was un unconscious when they pulled me out of the water, uh, but then they, they resuscitated me and brought me back. I hope I've explained that well. Yes, no, you have. And what's what's so amazing, as you were, as you were speaking, especially about the experience underwater, I had full chills or, you know, it's when the hair, for our listeners, if you don't know what that is, it's basically when the hair oh. on your arms or your legs or your, you know, your back goes, it literally, um, both arms, the, the hair went straight up on my arms and I felt also the same because I had a somewhat similar experience in the water. I, I don't know if it's the alchemy of the water, if it's because we are mostly made up of water, but the same experience many years ago about having a, actually a very close to death experience. And it was the most beautiful moment I have ever experienced. And I can't really explain it to people either. There's a connection that you have with everything, every single thing that's around you, you almost blend into it. And, and it's the most peaceful, most beautiful thing anyone can ever encounter. And after that experience, I've never been frightened of death after that because it was such a beautiful moment. Can you talk about that? Can you talk about the connection that we have with the world? I know that there's that saying, you know, we are all one or, or, or oneness. Is that something that you had experienced in that moment and that changed you? Or was it something that came to you? Wow, what a, what a brilliant question. I, I probably have never looked at it in that way. Um, I was very much aware as a, as a young guy um, up to the age of about 10 that even before my drowning experience, people, and that was at the age of seven, I, I noticed that elderly people would always talk to me on the bus. And, and back in the days when I grew up in the 60s, um, 1960s, there was a certain freedom then that, that children had, particularly in Australia. Um, it was a much more uh, trusting time. So, so we weren't um, held under the, the bosom of our family so much. Our parents would let us go down to the, the shopping centre or the plaza or whatever we wanted to do. And, and there was never any fear that anything bad would happen. It was more innocent times. So because I got to experience a lot of that freedom and just hop on the bus and go to the beach or catch up with friends and, and catch that bus, I really noticed how often particularly elderly people would talk to me and they would tell me all their problems and they would tell me all their life history and stuff. And I, I used to think, why, what is it about me that makes these people want to talk to me? And certainly after my drowning experience, um, I noticed it even more. But of course, once I drowned, that was when I started to, um, I woke up one night and there was ghosts standing around my bed. And that was when all the other really spooky spiritual things happened. But, but I think overall, um, what it gave to me, I, I think the biggest thing that connects the world is love. I think it's the energy to which people on the other side connect to us. It's the energy that we connect to each other, to the animals, to everything. Love, love is the universal law. Um, I, I'm a very grounded person. I'm not off in an airy fairy land at all. Um, I'm, I'm a guy and, and I'm a bloke and I'm, I'm not some <laughs> wussy, airy fairy, you know. Unicorn? You're not a unicorn? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so I, I think that gave me a real grounding of, of where my spirituality sat but certainly love is the biggest key to everything for all of us. And it's what we all seek and it's what we all need. Absolutely. Absolutely. And on that, I, again, I got a massive rush of full chills. If you don't mind, let's talk about as, so as you were growing up, were you getting more visitations from people on the other side, either people that you knew in like family members or people that you did not know, strangers coming to you because they could sense that you were able to pick them up? Were they coming to you a lot as a, as a young person? Yes, and I, I, it was never anybody that I knew, Christine. It was always people in old world clothes, like from another era, from 1800s Western America, how I would perceive Western America to be as a kid from seeing Western movies. Yes. Um, people from France and the French Revolution, from Spain all kinds of different cultures and they would just stand around the bed not a word was ever spoken but they would just stare at me but that they would smile i never saw it as a scary thing and the first time it happened i, I pulled the covers up over my head 
and hoped it would go away. But then when I peeked out again, they were all still there. So then I <laughs> started to just, to, to just chat with them. And I, I often say in many of the <clears throat> excuse me seminars, uh, events that I do when I'm speaking to people about spirituality, I actually think that um, I was very lucky that I, I grew up at a time there was no internet when I grew up. There was no Shirley MacLaine out on a limb books to read, which was one of the first spiritual books that I ever did read. There was no John Edward. There was no Alison Dubois. There was no n- none of the, the many and varied people that we have now, nor was there when I grew up the access to that information. So as, as a young boy, um, I could have fallen to pieces and let it all become a victim and be traumatised by it. But there was just maybe it's the Scorpio in me. But there was yeah. just this thing that I thought, I don't feel any fear. And perhaps that was the biggest lesson that I learned under the water. And as you said, I have no fear about dying or, or anything like that because that transition, I've already experienced part of it, at least anyway. And it was so peaceful and so loving and so warm. But I think um, that together with not having access to information, my, my choice was to learn about it in a constructive, positive way and find out what was happening to me. And it was through that that my journey really began. Even though the people who stood around my bed, they never said anything to me, I, I pretty well figured out who they were and and, and what their story was and, and where they were from. And look, I can even relate to it now. I, I actually have somebody from the missing MH370 plane uh, talking to me in Chinese for the, about the last month. And I can't understand a word that this young man is saying. I think he's about 26. He's speaking in Chinese, but I'm seeing uh, clear images of the plane and what happened before it disappeared. Mm. But it's the same energy that I, I had back as a seven, eight, nine, ten year old boy when the when the energies were standing around my bed. So I, I think everything has been a learning process and has just prepared me for all that was to come. I'm curious, and I'm sure our listeners are too, that when someone um comes to you from the other side and like you said it's it's it a lot of times it, obviously it's people that you do not know mm. um, and they're not able to obviously speak to you per se but do you do you hear what they're saying or feel what they're saying in your mind is it is it like a conversation that's going on telepathically for you sometimes <clears throat> i hear everything in in a sentence like it's playing out a movie um, sometimes it's like a broken up cell phone call where, where you're trying to hear your friend on the other end of your cell phone and, you know, they're driving through a tunnel and it breaks up and you, you, you cannot make out what they're saying. It can be as difficult as that. Sometimes there's it's just symbols like I might see a fish and it ends up being Fish Street or Fisher Place or their name is, is Fisher or Fishwick or something like that. Um, it, it comes in all different ways, yes. but I just managed to, to, to basically piece it together. I like the the fact that you're kind of like this, um, oh, you know, psychic Sherlock Holmes in many respects and with what you're doing now. And we'll talk about that in a second. But I want to go back a little bit to um, a lot of what you're, you've you've gotten and, and some of the predictions. I would like to let people know just some of the things that you have predicted that have come true. But sure. before we before we unveil those and talk about those a lot of what comes to you comes in dreams. Is that correct? Mm, that's right. Or, oh, Christine, it can happen when I'm washing the dishes. Isn't that terrible? <laughs> Isn't that just so ordinary? When did you when did you pick up on 9-11? Oh, I was doing the dishes. You know? <laughs> oh, my God. So, it, can, so it, it comes at different times. But does it, it with, with when you're dreaming or when you're asleep, is that when you have or... Is that when a lot of it comes in or just it's just random? Really, it, it, it used to be more when I was asleep as a younger person. But as I got into my, my 30s and 40s, it became just across the board. It would just come in at any time when I was, as I say, doing the dishes, watching TV, driving the car. Um, I teach martial arts. I'm a, I'm a black belt martial arts instructor. Um, I was actually at uh, karate today. So um, that's a big part of my, my spiritual uh, journey as well. It, it can be even when I'm at class. So it, it's just there. I mean, the person on the um, Malaysian flight MH370 that's disappeared for the last pop, couple of years, he's just he just popped up in my head in the middle of the supermarket while I was shopping. That was the first time I thought, who is this 
talking in my head now. It's and, and it was. I said it's all Chinese. I can't understand anything. But then it was amazing that even though he was speaking in Chinese, I began to understand what he was saying. But hearing it, I was hearing Chinese, but seeing the pictures in English. Yes. Yes. Mm, if that makes sense. Yes. Oh, definitely. No, definitely. And I'm I'm, I'm going to seek out a, a a friend of mine in Hong Kong who um is very fluent in Chinese, and I'm actually going to get her to help me with the translation of what I. Uh, other parts of it that I think that I, I'm, I'm picking up on because um, he's, he's obviously, as many of the people on Sensing Murder did, chose me to to field some kind of information, even in the end, if it's just private to, to members of his family, I'll, I'll track them down and tell them if that's that's what needs to happen. Do you do you find that a lot of the the, the people that come to you, um, the, the, the soul, the spirit of, of these of these people, do they come to you because they were because listen we all die we, we all die you know i believe that we all die and we're reincarnated many times some people just you know wake up one morning get ready get in their car and they you know have um, an accident or someone has a heart attack or something like that but do have you noticed do people come to you when they have been wrongly killed or or the story is not correct so that they in other words are they not being able to rest or is it that they're just reaching out for someone they have not moved on and they just really need to reach out to someone what has been your experience with that may i tell you that when i first um I, i can answer that through my very first experience of working on the sensing murder tv series which was solving or trying to solve um cold case crime and i was in melbourne doing my first case and we weren't told anything about the case that we were working on. You'd, you'd get your makeup done and the the girl doing the makeup, she, she was very careful about what she would say. And she said to me, I'm, I'm so, so scared. I'm going to trip up and tell you something. So they, they, it was just the cameramen, the, the soundies, the producers, no one would tell us a thing. And I led the film crew out to a cemetery um, about 11 miles out the other side of uh, north of Melbourne. And I was standing outside, it's called the Faulkner Cemetery, and it's a huge cemetery over quite a lot of acres, um, just headstones for as far as the eye can see, and this huge cross that stands in the middle of it that you can see, you know, for, for a mile or two before you actually get there. It's it's quite a few stories tall. And I stood outside the Faulkner Cemetery, and by then I'd realised that I was working on the case of a, a girl who had been murdered or, or a young woman. Um, I didn't know her name at that stage. I, I, I Well, I did. I actually called her... Um, Mercedes, like the car, but um, it was actually Messina, as it turned out. And she had unfortunately been killed by a serial killer in the um, the cemetery a few years early, earlier on a Saturday afternoon. She'd gone to lay uh, flowers on her grandmother's grave and unfortunately she was there at the same time as this horrible man was there. Um, but again, at this stage, I, I didn't know all that. This is what I found out afterwards. But I was standing outside the cemetery when we first arrived And I said to the crew, look, I don't know what's happened to this girl or what the circumstances are. I can only imagine how bad it must be because the show is called Sensing Murder. But I said, please tell this girl's family that there is nothing but peace and love and support coming from her. And Christine, ever since I did that first case, that's what I felt on every case that I've worked on since. That's what I felt when I've had family in front of me who's uh, someone has committed suicide, someone has died suddenly, uh, tragically in a car crash or dropped dead of a heart attack. Um, I had some uh, parents come through recently whose son had been taken by a great white shark when he was surfing. Um, Family members, especially when someone passes in traumatic situations, they want to know that the the person is okay, that they want to know that they didn't suffer or they weren't in pain. And I guess for all of us, I mean, the most often asked question that I'm ever asked by anyone in a reading, at a conference, at an event is, you know, someone died, are they okay? And they're absolutely okay. They operate on quite a different level and frequency that we do. They're not ruled by earthly emotions anymore. They take their place with us. And yes, they do watch over us, but they send us healing and love and for every person that I've ever um, tuned into or been approached from the spirit world, I have never felt any trauma from them whatsoever. The trauma lives with those in the living who are left behind. Mm. Mm. Wow. Whoa. I hope that made sense. Yes, yes, it did. And, and um, 
a, a, a lovely rush just came over. A lovely rush. I, it's not even. It wasn't even a goosebumpy rush. It was just this lovely rush that came over. Yeah. Um, and and so on, yeah. on a comical note, Christine, what I found with the human human race is that, uh, uh, you know, people say, "Oh, who's watching over me?" and "Who's my guardian angel?" and this, this, this. And I, I don't really look at it that way. I say, "Look, your people in spirit who have passed over, who who are close to you, um, th they send you love and healing and." that energy to get on with your life and be positive and make great choices. And of course, Christine, us human beings, we ignore all that and screw everything up on the <laughs> most part. <laughs> yes, you know, we do. <laughs> everyone's waiting for the big guardian angel answer. And I keep on telling people the, the answers are there all the time. They're, they're with you all the time. They're sending you that love and the healing all the time. When will you start to listen? Oh, I wish that I wish that so many people could hear you right now because they will, <laughs> they will. exactly they will we're we're heard by a lot more people now so it's good. Let's go into because you have been you've been called the world's most accurate psychic. So let's talk about some of the things that you have predicted, some mm -hmm. things that you predicted in the past that came true or are coming true currently. Let's talk about some of those things. I know you had mentioned earlier 9-11, uh, September 11th. Please, mm -hmm. please tell our, our listeners what happened with that and when, when did you actually see that or uh, feel that was going to happen? Well, that was on a, a radio show. I used to, um, and, and as you can probably hear from my voice, I've got a bit of a, a radio announcer voice because I've, I've been very fortunate to live in the media in, in Australia and New Zealand for all of my life. And I, I've, I've uh, been on radio and still am constantly and on television. And I had a number one rating radio show called Psychic Saturday Night 20 years ago. And um, a lot of the callers were saying, look, could you make a few predictions about what you think's, excuse me, gonna happen in the future? And at first I was reluctant to do so because I thought, well, what what difference does it make? But in the end, I thought, well, there, there is a few things that I, has come to me. So yeah, I think it was on September the 28th, 1996. It was around then. It was the second to last show that we did, actually. Um, we did a, a particular show on on um, predictions. It was all recorded, time-coded and dated, and all the current affairs shows, the magazines, the newspapers around Australia in future years got hold of those tapes, and it was all proven to be true. Again, lucky that I live in the media because, Christine, often after world events, there's plenty of people who claim that they predicted something, but nobody can, could ever prove it. And I, that's where the tag, the world's most accurate psychic, came along because for the first time ever, I could actually prove that it was real because not only did it go out to a million people on the radio, it also was time-coded and dated on logger tapes. You can't, 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 can't sort of um, throw that down the drain very quickly. No, you can't. <laughs> no. no, you can't. And what so, did you, yeah, what did you predict show, on the show? Uh, the the, the 911 one um, was uh, I said uh, the World Trade Center will be attacked again because it already uh, they'd driven a truck in down under the the car park in the basement I think in 1993 or 94, and and set an explosion off then to try to knock out the foundations of one of the towers, but it didn't really work. It caused some problems, but it wasn't a major catastrophe. So that's why I said the World Trade Center would be attacked again, um, either through or from the air in 2001, and on, in either September, October or November, with a preference on the month of September. And I said, what I can see is the, the towers are being attacked through or from the air. It's like a missile striking the building from the air. That, that's pretty well word for word what I said. And I said that in 1996. Wow. And that then we just... went on to um, Princess Diana, who, who I was speaking to anyway. We spoke eight or nine times. Um, and um, I, I said uh, Princess Diana needs to hopefully never break her security protocol, especially in France. But but there's um, a, a little bit like the National Enquirer and, and your sort of gossipy magazines in, in, in America. We have similar magazines here in Australia. And on one of the main covers, I had a dream on one of those kind of magazines where, do you remember, Christine, back in the day, Princess Diana was on every magazine. Every, every Everything. week. You, she was just everywhere. And I had a dream where there was the Eiffel Tower and Paris, and she wasn't on the picture. She wasn't on the cover. And within the dream, I said, where, where's Princess Diana? She's not here. Oh, she must be dead. And that's what led to that prediction. 
um, that it wouldn't be out skiing, that it was in a motor car or a motor accident, that she was just in the wrong place in the wrong time. Uh, John F. Kennedy going down in his light plane, I predicted that one. And, and the Bali bombings that happened um, 10 years or so, I predicted that and, and a few other things, plus some happy things as well about future sports people who would achieve. It wasn't all doom and gloom, but uh, 9-11, JFK, Princess Di, um, and, and others were amongst those. The Concorde in Paris, bringing an end to the Concorde era, predicted that one as well. So um, I don't know if I'm lucky or not, but I'm I'm fortunate that uh, my accuracy was good and that I had the ability to prove that it was actually done where, where others couldn't. Well, especially when with the uh, the recordings and the the radio programs that you that you're doing, let's talk about the 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 program because I I find that actually extremely in- interesting in sensing murder. So these were cold case files. You didn't know anything about them prior to it. No. But was it was it just you, or was it a team of psychics that were working on these cases? There was always two two psychics that worked on each case, on each episode, but we were always kept separate and we were filmed at separate times on different days. So uh, we never crossed paths. Oh, that's interesting. I, that's 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 good. I like that. Yeah. I, I actually I actually found it incredibly um, a difficult process to do and I'd never do it again because I, I just became so frustrated. I mean, imagine um, we would begin filming at 9 o'clock in the morning I'd be taken into a, a conference room of a posh hotel, you know, in Sydney or Melbourne um, or Auckland when we were filming in New Zealand. Um, and between 9 and 11, I would have to try and figure out what the case was and who it was that I was actually looking for. Uh, then by about 11.30, the crew would pack up, load up the van, take a lunch break, and then at 1 o'clock, we'd hit the road and we could only film till about four or five o'clock because then everybody had to go home. I mean, there was all these laws and regulations about when crews could work and when they couldn't. And so so I really had very little time within a 24-hour day. I had maybe seven hours to actually work and maybe try and unsolve a case that had been unsolved for 20 years. No pressure, Christine. <laughs> no pressure. Everybody and all the money that's being spent on that production. So it's, yeah. Putting, yeah, it's putting a lot of pressure on you. Yeah. But, but it was I just used to say, just tell me what the case is. I, I became extremely frustrated within two or three episodes because it was it was such a tough task to figure out what the case was. And you've used up 50% of your energy just trying to figure out what the case was. And then you'd go on the road and, and try and bring in new clues. Well, exactly. I was... if, you know what? If I was, okay, and, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, but if I wanted to solve cases let's say i i was um a detective in a police department or or uh, with the the government and i wanted to solve i would not spend all the time you know having you figure out well this was you know this was a child yes we know it was a child we, you know we, i would i would give you as much information as possible so that yeah. you could tell me and you would be able to pick up on on those that information that you've been given you would be able to pick up ah you know what i see a van i see this street it's you know here to so that we could quickly go and get you know find out more information or investigate instead of going on a wild goose chase yeah well that's unfortunately was the format of sensing murder and and still is if they ever bring it back you know i've been asked if i'd do it again and i said no <laughs> because um I became extremely ill um, at the end of one of the final episodes that I did because it was just such a drain on me emotionally and physically and probably spiritually to a certain extent as well. And um, uh, soon after I finished filming, it was thought that I'd had a series of strokes. So that was a major lesson to me to go, okay, you did it. You did it really well. You came up with a lot of good information. Um, But there were still people who used to, you know, YouTubers and stuff who would that they'd re-edit the show together and go, oh, well, he must have been told this because at 4 minutes 33 seconds he says this, but at 7 minutes 37 seconds he says that, and they've obviously gone and told him something. So do you know what, Christine, in the end, and I accept that it, it's part of life, there are always those who are never going to believe. That's fine, I don't care. But we went to so much trouble, or the crew did, to not tell me anything, and it was such a torturous um, exercise, you know, in the end that for people to then go and pick on it and basically say that you were told everything, ugh, <laughs> why no, bother? It, it's, it's, yeah, and I think if it, if it does, if, 
I would see, or I can see that if it becomes resurrected again, if you were in charge, if you were so, sort of the executive producer of it, and you cut out all that waste of time mm. and energy, and you know, I could, see, it would be wonderful to actually, I would love, as, as a viewer, and I don't even watch television, but this I would watch. If you had, you know, um, a team or a few of, uh, different psychics that you know personally, that you trust, sitting around a table and you're each given a file and it's and it's like here's all the information we know but this person vanished you know 10 years ago five years ago last week uh, the clock is ticking we want to find this person help let's you know what are you picking up that yeah. to me would be much more exciting and more important because then it's like someone's possible life is on the line but also family members of someone who had recently um vanished or you know if they were taken or abducted they can also get closure i can only see that really happening if you had control over it because your gift it, it yeah you don't want to waste your, your your time and your gift on that and have it affect you you know your health in any respect which i now really really guard what once you know when i was really sick i, I realized what i couldn't do and i a lot of the other psychics who worked on the show as well, not not that there were many, there, there was very few people that actually, I mean, the testing procedure was just just horrendous, but it needed to be that way to, to separate the, the, the good from the bad and the people who think they can do it and, and the people who couldn't. But we, we all got sick uh, along the way. And I've certainly been in discussions with networks around the world in recent times about future psychic programming or spiritual um, kind of programming and exactly what you were just talking about is very much what we've talked about and it's been interesting to speak to some I won't say like-minded producers but some some TV producers who they want to support my process and the process of the other people who are really good at what they do rather than immersing us in what the TV station wants us to do uh, to just entertain people you know a lot of the time they want you to jump hoops and do what I call being a performing seal to just to entertain people or come up with something. But if they would just let me and others just work within our process, we would come up with 10 times better than what we could as a performing seal. And fortunately, there's, there's producers now who are saying, what is your process? How can we support you? This is the kind of show we'd like to do. How can we do this in the best way that you can come up with as much information as you can? Which is a nice change, Christine. Well, it makes sense. It makes absolute sense. And as someone who is a producer myself, you know, as a well, it's been with radio, it's not television, but I know what I want to see. I know what I want to hear, and that um, is fantastic. That at least there's the there's people that recognize that and they're coming to you, you know, with that. Uh, yes. Folks, I just want to remind you, if you're uh, just tuning in, my name is Christine Blasdale. This is Out of the Box Radio, and my very special guest this hour is Scott Russell Hill, known as the world's most accurate psychic, Australia's acclaimed authority on paranormal and spiritual phenomena. And we are talking about this journey, this amazing journey that Scott has had over his lifetime and some of the predictions that he made that have come true. I want to I want to dive into Scott if if possible because I think this is what listeners really maybe don't understand but mm -hmm. but are some of them are waking up to the fact I believe that we all are psychic we all are we all have intuition it's just that maybe some people are able to tap into it more but you in your in the books that you have written and the material that you have available for for uh, for the audience mm -hmm. You do say that everyone is psychic, right? Everyone has this ability, and um, and there are just certain ways, certain things that people can do in order to tap into that. But I want to expand on that a little bit. Let's talk about everybody being psychic. Mm -hmm. I, I must say, first of all, that um, I, I've probably hedged against the word psychic a lot because, Christine, it's so misused. I know, abuse, I know. Okay, you know? But intuitive. And, uh, uh, let us let us all say that we let let us say that we're all intuitive, and we're all spiritual. Yes. And and that the word psychic is is incorporated within that. Um, once you bandy around, I mean, psychic is the word that is most associated with this kind of thing that we're talking about to a certain degree as a generalization, but it's not always applicable to what's going on. And then, of course, if you say you're psychic, then 
but many people have unrealistic expectations of what you can do as well. And there are plenty of people who, out there who claim to be psychic, who claim to do a lot of things and they can't. So, you know, that that's a whole other thing. But we all, I believe we all come, we sit up in spirit and we plan what we're going to work through in this life. Uh, we come into this life and then we start making choices. And the greatest gifts that we have is two words, as far as I'm concerned, choice and attitude. And it's the choices that we make and the attitude that we have towards our lives um, that makes all the difference in how intuitive we are or how psychic we are. We all know how we feel, but we fight against it. Um, the biggest thing that I'm up against in readings with people is how insecure people are and how crappy their choices are in their love life, in their jobs, in their families, in, in their own just solo ambitions to go around the world and travel. Oh, yes, but my mother wouldn't like it and this wouldn't happen and what would happen here and the cat might not eat its food and, you know, the whole world might cave in if I happen to take control of my life and go away for a while. Do you know, people just won't embrace their lives and they fight against their gut feeling and they make bad choices because they don't want to be alone but end up on their own anyway. Mm. So in the work, in the end, the, the way for all of us to, to open up and be truly to embrace that psychic, intuitive, spiritual side is to own how you feel and make the most positive choices and attitude that you can towards every part of your life, but don't deny what you feel and to not make decisions on insecurity and fear. That's what screws everything up. And that's what I, as a person who's been doing readings for many years, on, on any reading that I begin with anyone, the first 10 to 15 minutes of the reading is spent detangling the person. Most people, not everybody, but a good 80 to 90% of people that I, I've done readings for over the years are so messed up, Christine, that I have to spend 10 to 15 minutes being spiritual Dr. Phil to get them into a headspace <laughs> where, they can, where they can even begin to receive anything that I'm telling them, where they can even begin to start looking at their life or tuning into their own spirituality on a more different but positive level. Isn't that uh, so true? Because we, as human beings, we have this story of who we are. You know, we are who we are We because of our upbringing, this, the story of, of our lives. You know, I, mm. I must be this way. I need to be this way because as a child, this happened. I can't trust another human being because someone hurt me in the past. Uh, so Get I must be it. guarded, right? Huh? <laughs> Get over it. Get over it. <laughs> That's such a Scorpio answer. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I love it. And and what you were talking about too, the choices that we make. Um, mm. What I find is that we operate sort of out of two things: that we we make choices out of either love or fear. A, mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of times, it's made out of fear maybe because we're 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 a frightened that out of love we will be hurt i don't know i don't know and this is me included i mean I, I i i try as much as i can to to come from a place of love but you know once in a while that fear will raise its you know head and and we do operate from that i don't know if it's the fight or flight mode that we are hardwired with but I think people are starting to wake up a little bit more to the fact that our choices are either made up out of those two, out of love or fear. My experience is most people make their choices out of fear. Mm -hmm. and, and trying to break that is really, really bad. <clears throat> That's why so many people end up in relationships that are toxic. But the, the, the bottom line is I can always wind back the, the clock in the conversation that I have with people and say, before you went out with this person or before you married them or before this happened, you knew. You knew what they were like. You knew. You had. You knew. And they all know, but they go do it anyway. <laughs> you know? Oh, he's a serial killer and he bashes me up every Saturday night, but I think he's my soulmate. I hear <laughs> idiot stuff like that all the time. It's all fear-based insecurity. And, you know, the, the, the biggest thing that we are, are put on this earth to do, as far as I'm concerned, is to love and the first person we have to love is ourselves, ourselves. without getting all hokey pokey about it or airy fairy and because we refuse to to love ourselves and live in that space of individuality and good choice and good attitude we're waiting for someone else to complete us and we think that if we get married or are in a relationship or if we 
if we do this for all these people that everyone else will make it all, all okay, but everybody's as screwed up as we are. So in the end, you have to stand in your own space first, recognize what's going on. And once you do that, you start making really good choices and you start discerning who, who you allow into your life. And no one or no one or nothing is ever going to complete you. You know, the old Jerry Maguire thing, you complete me. I don't agree with it. It's not someone else who will complete you. It's you who will complete you. And once you achieve that, it all falls into place. It does. It actually does all fall into place. Once you, once you start realizing that the, all that love and attention and energy that you give other people, that you give you know, uh, everybody else, once you turn that around and you start focusing it on yourself, and it's not a narcissistic self-love, it's not uh, you know an ego thing of oh I love myself, mwah, mwah, mwah. it is truly loving what I do. This is this is what I do, um, and I I don't know if I'm the only person that does it, but I don't care. Um, I have this picture of of little baby Christine. She's probably two years old. Mm-hmm. This little child baby Christine, I put on my cell phone, you know, on your lock screen so that when you, when you go to use your phone and I use my phone for everything, I, you know, phone calls, internet, uh, social media, every single time I go to use my phone to even check the time, little baby Christine pops up yeah. and I immediately think of her when I make decisions, how I'm going to react to something how I'm going to react to a phone call, how I'm going to react to an email. Um, if someone texts me and they're maybe they're in a space of not love, you know, of anger or confusion or whatever, I always now am able to come from a space of that little girl as if she's my child. And I want her to witness an adult coming from a place of love because that's, that's yes, that's me. But at the same time, it's, what you're putting out into the world. And mm-hmm. when I've done that, and I've, ha- I've had this on just for maybe a couple weeks now, it's amazing what has come to me. The, the, the love, the opportunities, so much. We all have still, you know, you have rough days, things happen or whatever, but it's so much easier now because of that love that I'm giving myself through that child. Yeah, totally agree. I would, I would love to do, I would love to have so many people do that. So uh, listeners, again, it, 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 it may help you. It may not help you, but it's something that, um, that definitely guides me. Like I said, every single time I communicate with anybody, I always go through that, that child, little, little baby Christine. Um, I wanted to ask you, cause y- you had, uh, in your books, uh, and which are several that people can get and, and they're available on Amazon, correct? They are. It's it's fantastic. They're in on Kindle, but also on um, print on demand, which is an incredibly good idea. As so many bookshops here in Australia and New Zealand were going out of business because people just weren't buying books anymore. But as soon as they weren't available, then everybody wanted them again. So um, Amazon do a terrific job of printing the books. If people like to hold them in their hands, I've seen what they look like. They're great. Uh, but for those who are into the Kindle versions, they're also available. And so that's on, you can uh, do a search for Scott Russell Hill. I think there's about five, uh, five books that you have out right now. Yeah, they're, they're, they're all in order. They're, they're the Caught Between series of books. And the, the first one is called Caught Between Two Worlds. And the second one, which is the sequel to that, is called Psychic. And the third one is Awakening, which has got a lot of the Princess Diana stuff in it. Uh, the fourth one is Psychic Detective, which is all my time on Sensing Murder, every case that I've worked on on all the behind the scenes thing that happened on uh, Sensing Murder. And then the fifth one is called Grateful, which is uh, when I came out of what was believed to have been that series of strokes after I, I suffered bad health after working on Sensing Murder. And, and in the end, um, a friend said, so how do you feel now that you're out the other side? And I said, oh, I'm grateful to still be here. And then I went, oh, there's the next title of my next book. <laughs> so that's how that came about. <clears throat> so folks can get those on Amazon. And also, if you want to find out more information, uh, please do go to scottrussellhill.com. You can find mm. out more information. But in those um, in those books, too, you had made reference to something that I see all the time and a lot of our listeners see are the the numbers, you know, on your phone, on your clock, 1111 or 222 or 444. 
to you, what what does that mean? Because it's, I don't know about you, Scott, but I, I see this all the time, all the time. 1111 or 222 or 444, what does that mean to you? Well, guess what, Christine, that we talked about at the beginning of Caught Between Two Worlds book when we first started. Uh, my second book, Psychic, opens up with, I'm driving along a country road and I look at the clock on the car and it says 1111. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And people see 123 and ABC. Uh, there's there's different variations of it. The most simple way that I can explain it, that, that I've come to understand it, is that when you see that sequence, whatever it is that you notice the most, that is the time when you are most in tune with spirit. And that is the time when spirit is highly communicating with you. So when you see that, that's a time to sit back and reflect for a moment. Uh, see if you feel anyone around you or, or you may pick up any messages or if you've got a decision to make or something that you need to do for yourself. That is a spiritual reminder that the intensity of spirit, both from yourself and from the other side, is at a, at a maximum at that point. As you're saying that, I'm getting all the hair on my arms is going up and then it went around my um around my upper back all the way up through my neck just yay yes <laughs> and now and now and now all around my head oh it's lovely woo yeah. ah i love it it's it's like fireworks for me i get so i i do i love i love that feeling and it's just it's a beautiful feeling it's uh it's it's hard to explain to people the connection yeah that 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 is and it's just gorgeous what a wonderful what a what great job you have oh, oh my thank god you. Yeah. well I, I really enjoy it and in, in the end i mean i hope that i explain everything as simply as i can just like when you asked about 11 11 or, or other versions of it in the end christine spirituality is really simple it's people who are complicated if they choose to be and the more simple i don't mean simplistic but the more simple way that you look at things um, the easier things are and the easier and more quicker to understand things are as well. But if there's anyone who can mess up something with complication, it's a human being. <laughs> I've learned that one. And, and before we go, mate, when we started this conversation, before we went on air, you, you said, let's just let the conversation go wherever we want it to. And, you know, I'm sure that you'll lead me to, to things. May, may I tell you just one little thing before we go? Of course. It's all yours. Um when I was a, a little baby, because we talked about when, when I drowned, but even before that, when I was only six months ago, Christine, I, I can remember being in a pram outside my parents' house and it was a warm Saturday afternoon and all the neighbours were around um, in this new housing area. They were all getting to know each other. And I remember a lady leaning into my pram and, and cradling my face in her hands just gently and I could remember her, I could hear her talking to me and remembered her voice and her words, even when I was six months old. She said to me, you're a very old soul and you're here to do really special things. Well, I remembered that and I've always remembered that. Well, that lady, a few years later, unfortunately, she and her husband, um, their three children went to the beach one day in 1966 um, near where I lived. And those children disappeared from the beach and they've never been found. And it was 50 years ago this year since those children disappeared. And it's probably the most famous a missing person case in Australia. It's the, the missing Beaumont children. Um, as a teenager, I went to Auntie Nancy's place. She, her, her name is Nancy, the lady that held my face in, in the pram. And when I went around to her and Uncle Jimmy's house, her husband, um, there was three pairs of shoes lined up at the back door in this would have been 1976. So 10 years after the children disappeared oh. and that these three pairs of school shoes were at the back door because they were still waiting for their children to come home. Oh. And when I left their house that day, Auntie Nancy, she held my um, face in her hands again. And there I am as a teenager with my long scruffy seventies hair and my beard. Uh, and she held my face as I left and she said, you're a very old soul and you're here to do very special things. So I've always remembered that. And that is the foundation of how and why I do my work. That's why at first I never wanted to do sensing murder because I, I always had that memory of, of that family. I mean, when the children first disappeared, the police and dogs, uh, search dogs came through all the backyards of our houses and over the fences and were looking for those children. And, and when you asked me what I'd like to achieve just a moment ago, as, as well as the traveling and, and ever, whatever, 
I don't know. I, I don't use the word I, I want to solve that case. But I certainly have a lot of leads on that case and many people have spoken to me about it over the years. And, and Nancy and Uncle Jimmy are still alive. They're in their late 80s now. But 50 years later, their children have still not come home. Mm-hmm. But that, her saying that to me, um, everything that I've done in my life since then, especially because she and Uncle Jimmy suffered such trauma in losing not one, not two, but three children who were aged nine, seven and, and four at the time, two boys and a girl. Um, uh, sorry, two girls and a boy. The youngest one was the boy. Um, it, it impacted on, on me so much that I, I really treasure what I do, but that is what has placed the importance of the work that I do, that that's the level of, of how I enter my work. Whenever I mentor somebody, uh, speaking to you now, speaking at an event, doing radio, television, everything I've done over the years, I've always seen Aunty Nancy holding my face gently, telling me that I was here to do special things and I'm doing it for her and the children. Ah, oh, that is so, so beautiful. And I feel your I feel your heart all the way from Australia. I can feel your heart just, yeah. woo, just direct. Gets me emotional all, all the time, but oh. that's a good thing. I mean, I'm, do, do you know, I ended up doing Sensing Murder because in the end the producer said, because I, I said, look, I have never done this before and I don't want to upset anyone and I have a, the Beaumont family here, you know, in my hometown have gone through this tragedy. The last thing I'm going to do is be accused of milking other people's tragedy to make money. You know, you go through all these things and the producers actually said to me, and I wrote this in, in my book, Psychic Detective, they said, look, we'll pay you whether you come up with anything or not. Christine, that's an offer that a Scorpio can't refuse. <laughs> Oh, well, I, you know, they'll pay me anyway. I'll go and try it. And I went and tried it and, and some really good things happened. But I take what I take really seriously, but I still have a sense of humour. But I think that the more you're grounded in what you do and there's a, a backbone or an underlying foundation of where you come from, you know, I, I will always do special things. It's, you know, it's, it's always been there. And she, Auntie Nancy, said those words and they are always with me. It all comes from love. It does. It's love. It all a- comes from love. Every single thing that you just, everything that you just talked about, it all comes from a great source of love that comes from within you, and that you, you pay honor to. You honor your own. You honor love, and and that's why. Wow, you have so many. There's so many things that are gonna happen. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so excited for you, and, and and excited for everyone that is in your life. I really am. I want to thank you so much, Scott, for for joining uh, me this hour, for joining our listeners as well on Out of the Box Radio. Folks, if you want to get in touch with Scott Russell Hill, find out more about the work that he does and also find out about the books that he's written, you can go to scottrussellhill.com. Go on Amazon, get the Kindle version. Also, you can get the print on demand uh, of any one of his books or get them all if you like uh, at amazon.com. But it's Scott Russell Hill. And Scott, in our last couple seconds here, any parting words, anything you'd like to say before we, before we actually head out? Everything evolves around love. Love is the answer to everything. It's how the spirit world communicates to us. It's how we communicate to the spirit world. It's how we communicate to each other, our animals, who are also members of our family. But most importantly, it's the key to how we really need to speak to ourselves. No one will ever love us as much as we love ourselves. And once we do that, then the love that we have just flows on to everyone else. So true, my Scorpio friend. It's it's, it's love. (laughs) Everything is love. What a wonderful way to end the show. What a wonderful way to end the show. I want to thank you again, Scott Russell Hill, for joining us here on Out of the Box Radio. And I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. Remember to tune in next week for another episode. And if you'd like to make sure you never miss an episode of Out of the Box Radio, You can, of course, subscribe to the YouTube channel or subscribe to the show on iTunes. And we're now available on iHeartRadio, reaching a lot more people. So you can subscribe to the program there, too. So thank you so very much. Thanks again, Scott. Thank you so much. But it's been lovely. Thank you, Christine. Uh, And you're you're welcome back anytime, anytime. If you get a a hit for wanting to come back on and talk about something in particular, please, please do reach out to me. I'd love to have you back. I absolutely will. All right. Thank you so very much. And thank you, listeners, for for tuning in. Until next week, I want to remind you to always, always think outside of the box. Bye for now.